I'll do sort of a formal introduction uh, and then we'll dive right into it. Um, are you on any kind of time constraint that I need to be mindful of before we get rocking? No, no, I have till 12, uh, which is it's 10 o'clock here our time. But uh, how about an hour? Is hour good? Oh, that's perfect. I, okay. I, I, I think we'll keep it for me because we got PE classes going on. So one sec. Yep. Yep. You're good. All right, so so is the lighting all right? So my forehead, which is it's the perfect. size of Asia, doesn't really uh, shine a light into people at all, or it looks good to me. So okay. all right, excellent. Well, we will get rolling. Um, welcome, coaches. Today we are joined by Coach Doc Shepler uh, of Pinewood High School out in California. Um, very excited to uh, speak with him today and and to have him on the show. So, Doc, welcome. Thanks for having me. I love to talk basketball. Let's get going. Yes, absolutely. Well, I uh, want to talk a lot about offense. I know the way that you guys play um, is, if, if anyone's not familiar, I think very impressive, just the speed, the pace, the skill level. Um, so obviously for someone like myself that is familiar, but then also for maybe those who haven't seen you play, kind of describe just uh, what, what your style of play is like and maybe how that connects to your offensive philosophy. That's a good question. I, I always like to hearken back to 1987 when the three point line was put into uh, it was put in a couple of years early. But Rick Pitino and his uh, Providence team was the first team really, L, really looking to utilize that three point shot as an effective weapon. And they made it all the way to the final four. And as a boys coach at that time and as a shooter myself, when I played and was still playing at that time, you know, in rec leagues and things like that, it was like, OK, well, my team's going to play like that as well. So that's how it started to evolve. What is that? 35 years ago, no, 36 years ago, something like that, to where right. this is how my teams have played, to where we shoot threes. And uh, we, we develop those shooting abilities with our players that we have. So that's where it started. And as time has gone on, being somebody that's always trying to be progressive and have a growth mindset and trying to learn more, it's evolved into, and learning from others as well, um, it's evolved into something to where we've, we've pretty much got a good handle of how to play to make ourselves um, offensively efficient. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you mentioned three-point shooting. That certainly is a mark of your teams. What are some other things that you stress often that, 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 that you would say kind of characterize your offense? Well, the first thing that uh, rem let's let's table that question. Um, you want to develop your shooters. You know, all this stuff. It doesn't mean jack squat if you don't have great shooters and if you don't understand how to make somebody a better shooter. In terms mm -hmm. of you know I, the the virtual clinics I've done and the individual work I've I've. I back in 86, I started my own business of working individually with with basketball players. And I, I was looked at like an idiot. It's like one on one basketball training. It's like, yeah, they have tennis lessons and racquetball lessons and golf lessons in terms of technique. I'm going to teach people basketball lessons. And that's when I started working with people and my expertise as a player was shooting. And I've learned to teach shooting uh, very well and well into the extent to the extent that you can one of the fallacies involved and i think these is one of your questions that you're going to ask is that you can't change somebody's shot you can't mm -hmm. do that and it's totally a fallacy you can do that so the cornerstone of our team the foundation of every team that wants to play this style you have to be able to shoot the ball you have to you know a lot uh, 30 to 40 minutes every single of your practice day into shooting the ball. And mm -hmm. not only in situations where everybody, and I say this to players that I work with individually, is everybody on the team has got to hit a catch and shoot three. If mm -hmm. everybody on the team can hit a catch and shoot three, your team's going to be successful because there's five shooters. You're going to put five shooters on the floor and you're going to space the floor to an extent where, where are they going to help off of? And if you run certain actions, certain triggers to get those shots, and you train your kids to shoot in those situations, whether it be off a dribble or, 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 or off the catch and learn different shots, different spots, different conditioning levels, um, you're going to be pretty successful. And our style of play is such to where 
we, we want to get into the quote blender or dominoes as soon as possible. Well, how do you do that? Well, you train your players like dogs to react to them getting possession of the ball, whether it be on a turnover or a missed shot or a rebound that you have an organized system of which you create that. And there's several different systems of which coaches have followed. And um, I'm pretty good at teaching this particular one in terms of transition where it's primary break and we run some drive motion principles with a point guard. This year, our, our point guard wasn't that style of player that creates advantages with being able to break a defensive player down and do it. So we had to do it in other means to be able to do that. But that's basically um, our offensive system. And um, it's worked really well for us, but it wouldn't have worked well unless we can shoot the ball. Absolutely. And as, yeah. And as time has gone on, <clears throat> when old school way of help and recover – Uh, is now no help on the strong side or no help at all. And for a time there, our team wasn't being able to finish plays. So we came up with a finish list where it's almost like a playlist on Sonos or something like that, that they have their finish list that they can finish off two feet. They can finish off one foot. They can finish off the other foot. They can finish off a one, two, and they basically have a finish that they have mastered individually and now they do it against a defensive player. And now they must project that into doing it in a game situation. Um, so we really worked hard on finishes about 10 to 12 years ago to where now, now we've mastered the shots that we want the kids to be able to make in games, whether that, mm-hmm. and they've mastered making a floater, they've mastered different finishes. We don't shoot mid range shots between 12 and 19 feet, which gets me in trouble sometimes with people. No mid range game. It's like, well, it's not the most efficient shot, especially right. when it's contested and pressured. Um, if you have somebody on that team that's able to do that, I don't think Kawhi Leonard or Kevin Durant or DeMar DeRozan is walking through my gym. So uh, it's it, it's nice to develop that shot. I work on it with players that I work with individually, but it's not a shot I work on with my particular team. Our mid-range shot with our team is 8 to 12-foot floaters. And we practice that every day and they've mastered that shot. And I've, I've said this on other podcasts that I've done is that I want them to be considered a golfer is that a golfer has to have, you got to be able to drive, got to have mid irons. You got to have short game in terms of being able to chip, being able to come out of a sand. You got to have every shot in your bag. Well, with my team, if I want them to shoot a shot in the game, I want it to be something that's practiced, something that's, mastered that they can they can do that and master it in a game um so that's basically our our, our way of thinking with that yeah. so i don't I love it our- yeah well i th- there's so much good stuff in there i'm gonna rewind back to the shooting component and i know that was kind of late in my list but it sounds like a, a good starting point sure. um you know definitely I, I i think the teams that i've been a part of we feel the same way the more shooting we can put on the floor the better more shooting more skill more space more fun um, you know, for you, you've got returners coming into your program. You have freshmen who may be new. Where are you starting? Um, and, and maybe what are the essential components to getting the girls in your program to shoot consistently so that your offense can take shape? You know, it's I, the, the clinics that I've done. It's so easy to do that because so many people have been taught in your background as as a player. Everybody has been taught certain things that are the template of being a great shooter, but they might not be physically true in terms of how you coach somebody on, get your elbow in, bend your knees, put a little arc on the ball, put a lot of arc on it. Um, You know, jump straight up and straight down. All those things are such to where those are things that we were taught, but those are things that aren't physiologically, kinesiologically, how somebody effectively shoots a ball. Mm -hmm. So there's four components that I attack is just most of the time when people come in as a freshman, they might have prior habits to it. And everybody has different anatomy situations. Like some of the girls on my team don't have textbook shooting form, but the ball is straight. Their arc is the same. They jump the same way every single time and their shot is quick and they hop after that shot. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to adjust their release according to, how I want them to shoot like Clay Thompson, I'm going to work with them. And as long as the ball is straight, as long as their arc is the same, as long as it's repeatable, 
you can work with someone. And most of the issues that I work with with shooters, they don't jump quick enough. Mm -hmm. They don't jump the same way every single time. Their knees will give into the ground and they'll Draymond Green it. I got a backpack on and jump slowly. Mm -hmm. And when you fix that, you add power to their shot. And most kids, even, you know, college players, they've been taught to shoot with too much art. So when I am the human Noah machine, my eyes can see mid forties in terms of arc angle. I have a Noah machine at my home gym at my house. And throughout the years, I've learned to watch ball flights and I have videos of, you know, some of the great shooters shooting the ball and everybody shoots with the same arc every single time. Some people prefer a lower arc than medium. The, the, the facts that have come out, through data is 45 degrees is the perfect arc 11 inches into the rim is the perfect depth point of which you shoot. And most of my players prefer better control of the ball and they like more control means your arc is a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. And some kids don't like a lower arc. They started a little, so anything between 43 and 47 is acceptable. I personally, when I shoot, I like more control of the ball. I'll shoot with 42, 43 and, I'm giving up surface space for the ball to go in, but I'm also gaining better control of my ball flight. So with players coming in, it's a matter of if I get them to jump a little quicker, have the same release every time, get their feet to flow forward and have their arc be more controlled with mastered computer, not computer, but tuned against a wall. I know that they're going to be better shooters. As an example, as my one shining moment here as a shooting coach, a girl came in as a freshman, arc was too high, release was not great. She jumped straight up and straight down. Um, last year in a shooting drill, 30 seconds at five different spots, changing spots for two and a half minutes, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. <clears throat> she made 46 out of 47. Oh, yeah. Catch two threes. Now they're from the same spot for 30 straight seconds. So you get your knowledge of results. But you need that repetition to develop the ability to make shots when you start expanding their repertoire of not only shots, but also different distances and stuff. You need that repetition as the cornerstone foundation of that. But if you can do that with somebody, and 46 out of 47 is pretty darn good. I mean, Absolutely. It's, it's you know not even darn good. It's just amazing that a high school sophomore can make 46 out of 47. And yeah, for uh, sure. when they come in, you, you want to have them have a repeatable shot. Most of the time when I work with someone and, and a lot of times when people watch this, you might deal with a seventh or an eighth grader or a fifth grader or a sixth grader that might not know anything about shooting a ball. But the first thing I attack and I've changed within the last four years is rhythm. Mm. It's just rhythm. They hold the ball at their waist. They jump like they're shooting the ball and you feel their feet flow forward after they shoot it and they get the rhythm of that. And I, the reason I did that is because as a PE teacher, I'll have junior high PE kids and we'll have a basketball unit and some of them never touched a ball before. But after two minutes of just doing that, every single one of them looks like they have a nice looking shot mm. until they shoot the ball. But the rhythm of it is such to where they're using the ball as they jump in a nice one motion pattern. Their feet flow forward. And when they get the rhythm first, then you can attack, you know, the mechanics of the release, making sure they're pushing equally with both feet, making sure their stance is good. Then you work into the hop. Then you work into different shots that they can master. And then you expand their repertoire. But the foundation that you want everybody on your team is can they hit a catch and shoot three? And that's what we do. If everybody on our team can hit a catch and shoot three, we're going to get the shot we want. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then I guess a question I have to follow up there, whenever you're working with a shooter, you kind of know in your mind the different things you're looking for. What are you actually studying with your eyes? And maybe what are some of the cues that you find helpful to help those players do the things that you, you know to be true in your mind? Well, I like feel phrases, John. I like feel phrases. When you say the word spring, what does that mean to you when you when you internalize spring? What does that mean when you jump? Very quick off the ground. Bouncy, elastic, yep. 
and and you come up with terms that resonate within them when you say bouncy athletic uh, elastic but controlled defined purposeful it means that yeah i don't want to see you jump 45 inches on your shot everything is going to be the same so spring 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 with little kids i love saying boing boing Mm -hmm. boing boing that gets them thinking spring 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 the other thing is snap when you shoot the ball when you snap your wrist, that's an assertive, aggressive, confident, bold move to where I'm snapping. And when you say sweep your feet forward, they get the feeling their feet are flowing forward. So spring, snap, sweep. It also can be feet, uh, flick, and flow. Three Fs. doesn't matter how you do it. But have those things resonate with them. And when I watch somebody shoot, that's what I want after that but the progression to get them to do that is something where i start without the ball then we work a release and then i have them shoot the ball against the wall feeling that as time goes on so that's pretty much that much much how i accomplish that with somebody is that know that the know that as a learner you need something to feel so when somebody is teaching you you obviously have feedback from that coach but when they go off and shoot on their own, what are they going to remember? Boing. You know, they're going to remember mm-hmm. the boing. They're going to remember the snap. They're going to remember your feet have to land forward. Most of the time when I work with players that don't have their feet flow forward after they shoot in terms of distances, they end up six feet from the basket because they're flowing forward, but they're not taking a step back to where they were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they're getting closer and closer and closer. And that's where you know that they're doing it right because they're getting closer. See, now your feet are flowing forward. Uh, one of my uh, acquaintances used to play in the NBA. His name is Benno Udrich, mm-hmm. uh, NBA player. During the pandemic, he lived in the area and he came and did some shooting in my gym. And he had a, a great teaching point of he'll put his hand on somebody's lower back or their, even their, their tailbone. And after they shoot, he'll – He'll gently nudge them forward so their lower body, they feel that pressure going forward. Um, And that's another technique that, oh, I like that. So somebody doesn't get it. And it's not a a broad jump forward. It's a feet flow forward. And when somebody doesn't get it, I'll show them a video of somebody that does it. And they go like, oh, see how relaxed that looks? And you describe the word rhythm to somebody when somebody's a great dancer or has a great golf swing or a tennis stroke or kicks a soccer ball well. When you talk rhythm, what does that mean to you when you talk rhythm? It means the effective flow of doing a skill. The whole body is working as one to accomplish a task. So when you watch Clay Thompson shoot a ball or Steph or Lillard or these people at the highest level, when you look at their rhythm of their shot, it looks like effortless power. Mm -hmm. rather than a powerful effort when somebody tries to have a powerful effort it means their upper body is really to get it there and that's when flaws in their shot they'll start to their hips will rotate or their upper body will rotate or their arm will rotate or their hand will rotate when they shoot the ball Uh, or they'll start to use their off thumb a little bit too much to impart power so when i work with somebody initially it's all about developing that effortless power. And I always like to use this and feel free to use this because I, you have to be fun when you work with somebody, you have to be goofy. And I am the definition of goofy. Um, when, when you watch the wizard of Oz, the, the key theme of the wizard of Oz is the, um, the good witch said to Dorothy, you've always had the power. You just had to learn it for yourself. And that's exactly what kids in terms of shooting They've always had the power. You just have to learn how to do it yourself in terms of feel that. So long-winded answer to your question. I apologize. Excellent. No, that that there's tremendous. And then, you know, moving forward and connecting shooting with offense as a whole, I know a big thing for you guys is just quick decisions off the catch, getting the defense in recovery, and then not bailing them out. So there's a a decision-making component to should I shoot, should I not shoot. I know that fundamentals do tie into that. Kind of discussed – um, I guess, number one, the technical components of what allows the player physically to to attack closeouts, but then also teaching the decision-making aspect. Of yeah, it. great question. That's 
that's the that's the piece of the puzzle that is the next piece after a foundation of somebody was shooting. The other thing I want to mention before I answer that question is mm -hmm. having a developed quick shot. So we time our players on their catch and shoot. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, if I have a quicker catch and shoot, basically that means distance covered by the defensive player that they can't get there. So I always show a video of a, a, a gentleman I work with, Patrick McCall. I used to play in the, the NBA. I think he's Europe or somewhere in the G League or something. I have an example of, okay, this release is 0.95. And then after 10 minutes, it's 0.63. Mm -hmm. So that three tenths of a second means if somebody's the world's fastest human, they cover, you know, 100 yards in 10 seconds or 10 yards in one second. That means that's nine feet of space in mm. terms of a tenth every three feet. So if you speed up somebody's release, they, they have to be there on the catch. So if you have a quick release, and you have a great catch and drive where you split and sprint. The next component is related to your question where you have to get them to master spatial awareness of driving when they're closing and taking away the space and shooting when you have enough space or mm -hmm. moving the ball when they're there on the catch. So the goal of every closeout is to be there on the catch to where there's no advantage. A player in triple threat, a player coming off a dribble doesn't have the advantage on a defensive player that a closeout has. And I learned that in 2004, we're playing one-on-one -on -one and every day in our practice with different players and different groups and stuff. And I noticed that we played closeout one-on-one, -on -one, we play off dribble one-on-one, -on -one, and then we play triple threat one-on-one. -on -one. And I was so dumb. And it was like that closeout one-on-one, -on -one, the offense kicks their ass every time they're going right. by when they take away the shot and they they all have good catch and shoots and it wasn't until then where i realized you know what maybe we ought to just run our actions to get this close out mm -hmm. and that was 2006 or 7 something like that and then it was like oh my god it's all get that person out of the post get them out put them on a weak side and now now five out is becoming so prevalent as well. But training that component means that, um, and I want you to I want you to think about a hitter in baseball. Did you play baseball, John? I had a very short baseball career yeah. and most of it was spent yeah. spitting sunflower seeds on the bench. That, but let me tell you, that's all right. Well, you probably you couldn't hit because you didn't plan to hit the ball and react not to hit it. Mm. Well, that's what I do with our basketball players, translating that from baseball. I want you to plan to shoot. And react to drive. So it my, my whole term, weapon on a catch. When I catch the ball, I'm a weapon right when I catch the ball. Villanova has adopted this, you know, when Jay Wright was coaching there, that they had the same thing. And I feel like, did you watch my videos about seven or eight years ago about this? I don't know. But th this is what I learned from watching the Spurs playing point five basketball in the mm -hmm. early 2010, 2011. It reinforced how my team played as well as that, now I'm more convicted to like, you'll never catch and hold the ball. You'll right. never catch and get in triple threat and you're never going to jab three times and then go between your legs and then try to attack. You know, we're always trying to get them moving. And so when you train people to plan to shoot, react to drive, you have to play lots of one-on-one. -on -one. You have to train that, in a guided situation where they see their space on the catch, they feel their space. The girl that makes 46 out of 47 will always, and we need to improve her development in that, right? She's a wonderful girl. She'll catch off a hop. Then she'll look and then she'll tap and shoot the ball hmm. instead of seeing in her peripheral vision, kind of have a feeling of where that person is as they're catching the ball and then making that quick decision based on, what she kind of perceived was going on there. And that's, that's an issue as well with, with that, but playing guided one-on-one -on -one, close out, have them read that, you know, and do close out shooting as well. Is that recognize your space and close out shooting, recognize your space in a drive to where you're going to split and sprint and then make it live and then make the pass come from different areas and then make it from different spots. But they have to master that. And I don't know who came up with this term. 
It certainly wasn't me, but I freaking love it. His first touch decision. Mm. Was it you? Nope. Yeah. Was it Noah LaRoche? Who was that? It's yeah, like, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I've heard it said by many people, and I know that like I cool. do use it myself. Somebody it used it originally, yeah. you know, and somebody used the word advantage originally. And I think Brian McCormick and I mm-hmm. kind of need a little bit of credit for advantage basketball because Absolutely. his little booklet, Small Advantage, Big Advantage, mm-hmm. now I'm hearing it all the time. It's how the Warriors play out here. I hear Kerr and uh, the assistant coaches talk about advantages and things like that. They've had to tra- retrain Andrew Wiggins to be catch and hold into a catch and attack player. And he did that great last year. Um, he's improved his shot. I'll take a little credit for that. But anyway, um, no, he wasn't dipping the ball on his shot. He right. catch and go right up. And they couldn't, he didn't realize you shot so much better off a dribble because your gather was right at your waist. Mm-hmm. And his rhythm was better because he's jumping with the ball here rather than jumping with the ball here. And uh, anyway, that's a side note on it. But just master that first touch decision over and over again every single day of practice, every day. Because if that's the foundation of your offense, then you have to have them. And it's a decision, right? Hey, mm-hmm. you know, you talk about, you know, coaches with their, their term. Oh, uh, Draymond is a decision maker. Yeah, he, he can see the floor and make good decisions and all this other stuff. But the one you want, if you're going to play this style, is that catch and decision to be able Absolutely. to drive or shoot. And I always say, if you made the wrong decision on your shot, what happened? So I'm I'm guarding John. You caught and shot it, but it was the wrong decision to shoot. What happened? Uh, well, physically, the ball's headed towards the rim, which is not a bad thing because it may bounce in. Chance to offensive rebound. I blocked your shot. Okay, I got you for sure. Yeah, I blocked yeah. your shot. In other words, you should have drove. Mm-hmm. But I'm in your space. And you have to assess athletic ability, length, and all that in your brain and stuff like that. Right. But basically, if somebody drives and it's the bad decision, they didn't get by him. All right. in, you know, I've divided three three shots and drive areas, catch and shoot, dribble and triple threat. So we have several different shots that I want them to master out of catch and shoot that come up from different, you know, in other words, hop turns or square in the airs coming down from a pin down, coming from a dribble handoff, coming from an off ball screen. Um, Those types of situations uh, off of the triggers of, uh, flare screens and things like that. You have to basically drill your players on the movement first, the specific first step movement, the balance, the deceleration to be able to shoot the ball. All those things go into a fact that you wouldn't be able to do unless you develop a great catch and shoot at the mm-hmm. start. So, and then you work on different shots off a dribble. Uh, they're not a higher percentage, but my whole thing when I teach a shooter is that you want to practice the hard shots to make the easy shots seem easier. Mm -hmm. You want easy shots in terms of the shots you create as an offense. You don't want somebody shooting hop backs and keep in mind, I call them hop backs, not step backs because you ain't stepping back. Larry bird step back. You are hopping back. So call it what it is, you know, Sure. call it a guide hand because a guide hands for the blind lead me (laughs) on that. My guide hand is my balance or off hand. It's not guiding the ball Mm -hmm. to the target. So please, be literal in the terms you use. So that's absolutely that. that. Sorry. No, I love but, it. Yeah. Um, so, so then kind of thinking through practice, I know we've just talked about like that one-on-one individual skill. You mentioned it's a huge part of what you guys do. Um, two questions I'll ask to follow up on that. Number one, as you're planning practice, are you trying to just cycle through those things systematically? And do you have a system for kind of categorizing what you need to review and what you need to go over. So that's like the planning side. And then in actuality, do you have a a format to your practice where the same thing happens at the same time to ensure it never gets missed? Um, We like to vary, you know, one of the hard things as a coach, as you well know, it's like footwork, balance, stops, starts, cuts, pivots. All those things are boring for kids to do it every day, but it's something you have to have variety and doing it in a different way. So it remains fresh. So Mm -hmm. we try and do that. We try 
our basic, you know, practice regimen after they do their, their band work, they do their dynamic warm up, And we work a lot of footwork in our dynamic warm up. where we work on different types of cuts, just a, a, I call it a stamp cut, which is a basic change direction cut, a stutter cut, a stop cut where you're splitting your feet between the legs dribble, which is a foundation for footwork. And we work on different footwork to start. One of the things that just drives me freaking crazy is kids don't know how to start their sprint. Mm. They either take a long gallop and then go, or they take a positive step forward and start running without a push off. So we work a lot on a load step, negative step, plyo step, however you want to per to master first step speed. Because I always like to describe basketball as a sport of balanced stops and explosive starts. And somebody that can change their pace by different movements, whether it be skips, gallops, however you want to put it, they basically master the move. So we want those movements every single day in our practice. So they become basketball foot conscious. Um, Lee Taft is a great resource for basketball speed uh, that I've used in the past. And he's marvelous in terms of getting away from defensive sliding, you know, Hip turn, you know, his hip turns, his plyo steps, all of his thing are applicable to basketball because these how people move. I was Mm -hmm. when I was in junior college, I would get beat by a guy all the time because I would I was taught to defensive slide to cut off somebody's drive. It's like that guy runs a 10, 800. I'm 13 seconds. How in the hell am I going to stay in front of this guy? Right. right. I don't turn and run. So we work a lot on those specific basketball foot skills. So our practice has a, a flow to it. I always like to tell people in, in two hours, I want them walking away. We don't run liners unless it's punitive. That our practices involve, I want you to take 100 to 150 shots every practice in not just threes, but every shot you would take. I want you to make a lot of decisions in every practice. And I want you to be able to adjust those decisions and feel free to make mistakes within those things. And that's every practice, whether or not it might be as season goes on, we don't do that as much, but I want them to leave away from practice with a smile on their face and they're exhausted because the pace is quick. They're going to play a lot. Ones, twos, threes, fours, disadvantage, advantage drills, all those things that make them develop as a player, because no matter what plays you have, it doesn't matter if they're you know, they don't have the skills to make those plays. So certainly no, that's I love it. I love it. Um, And and our practices flow girls that go from, go to other high schools, they come to our practice and they're exhausted after an hour and a half, but there's a smile on their face. Well, why is that? Because they actually felt that they were getting better. They, Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the purpose of practice, even at the college level that so many times go through a three hour, too, too much of it is prep. Too much of it is, you know, getting ready for the other team and our offense and our defense. Hey, that's great. But what are you doing to make your players individually better in terms of how they shoot, how they drive, how they finish, how they move? Are they getting stronger? Are they having fun? Mm -hmm. Or are they not having fun? They're going to go in the portal, you know? So uh, I just thought I'd throw that portal line there. So Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's certainly exploding. Um, how, How do you join then? You know, to, to play this way off the catch individually, I have to have space to whenever I drive that ball, be able to make plays. And that requires coordination with other people on the floor. You, um, you know, certain systems are very rigid and you may have less options on the catch because of what the rules of the offense and the cuts give you. How, how does your system, and you can share as much or as little as you sure. want here. How are you teaching the girls off the ball to create, make and keep space so that you guys can play that way off the catch? Well, I figured this out a couple of years ago too, John, is that I've inverted our offense to a point where I go over the blender and our off ball spacing first. Mm -hmm. We just start with four people. We used to do a drill called the Spurs drill, where it's just three people, uh, three people involved, but you have a lines at each spot and it's based on drive and kick, drive and kick. Okay. Now we're going to dribble handoff, drive and kick. Okay. Now back doors are optional. Now dribble handoffs are optional, all that, but it's like three people and it got away from the spacing involved. So now we go four on O a lot and we work on, okay, you got drive that person in the, in the corner can either back cut or stay home in the corner. We don't really lift up on penetration. 
We have that person dragging behind the drive and we have that person lifting up. And that's another point that nobody was helping on a strong side drive. They were dipping down to take the weak side post pass away, mm-hmm. but we didn't make the cross court pass well. So we playing against Sabrina Ionescu for three freaking years. She was a professional at skip passes, mm-hmm. skip overhead passes. And now you watch Luka Doncic and other players where they make those hook passes. So we work on overhead passes and jump overhead passes. Mm -hmm. Because if the help is coming from the weak side, that's the close out, the long close out we want to get. They're not helping from the strong side. So we work a lot of four on O and run different actions from that four on O. And then when we do our five on O work, we do that at the very start. Mm. And then we run our actions against defense And then we have certain things we do transition wise in terms of primary break, secondary break. So everything is a read based on what happens up the floor. We could get into the Princeton. um, I don't know what they call it, the chin or whatever they call it. It's a dribble handoff, ball reverse, shuffle cut, flare screen. We can do that if there's a dribble handoff. We have six or seven different counters to that where we'll run back doors. As a result of that, they take away this. We're going to do that. Um, we love flare screens now. Um, and it's all a read with the point guard drives middle and comes to a stop and passes to the trail. Well, then the two will set a flare for the one. And if that's not open, then the, the three or the four is setting a flare for one another, slipping that as well, coming off a dribble handoff. All that is based on primary break and training your players to be reactive And this is where our first step speed comes in, that if it takes me four hours to get full speed, you know, who who refers to it as the racetrack? There's some coach that calls between the top of the key of the racetrack. I don't know who it is, but it's like, I love that. You should be sprinting between the top of the keys. That's the racetrack. So your first step speed to react to you getting possession of the ball, them making the shot or creating a turnover has to be quick. And that's where you develop your first step speed. So our primary break is same point guard, same same person takes it out. We have two people running the rail and we have a rim runner running the post. And then, you know, out of the primary stuff, the one can drive and create the advantage, the pitch ahead to the two, the two can create an advantage. Um, They can go cross court to the three and the three can create an advantage or the five can go through for me and I can drive off their back or I can pass to the five and cut through, or I can dribble and do a, a kickback to the five as well. Yep. Those are primary break things that we do. Um, I've kind of gotten away from that because the last couple of years on my team, we haven't had a main creator that can create advantages. We had to do it with, you know, our secondary actions to mm-hmm. create that closeout. Um, everybody on the team can shoot, but if you can't get them in catch and shoot, Then what are you doing? So we work really hard on dribble moves with everybody. They can attack a stationary or a defender where they're creating that. Um, But the last couple of years, we've had to adjust uh, our our mindset and how to do that. So um, I hope that answers your question. I don't know. Sometimes I can ramp, but definitely does. The true drive motion when it was came into, you know, it's like if you don't have good drivers and decision makers. Uh, that's not the offense for you. And Mm -hmm. if you don't have good shooters, it's not a good offense for you. But if you can teach your kids, A, how to shoot, how to make your first steps decision, how to finish, how to make decisions, then it, then it fits. It fits. That's where the player development part of it doesn't reach them. They don't understand that. It's not the offenses that are what's, you know, it's your ability to teach the game and make those things. You know, Absolutely. one of the things about the Princeton stuff, somebody said, you run a lot of Princeton actions, is, but then then you then you go into drive motion after that. And it's like, well, that flare screen gets the close out and then we're in drive motion after that. So a lot of times people don't realize and it kind of <laughs> hope Tara doesn't see this. It was <laughs> at Stanford that they would run great Princeton stuff and then Haley Jones would get a close out. And she holds the ball and Mm -hmm. whatever advantage you had from that action. Now you're, now you're screwed. Now you got to 
create another advantage with right. your ability to go rather than use that Princeton action to create the closeout you want or, you know, a backdoor layup or a catch and finish. However you want to talk about advantage is, is pretty much, you know, the same thing, but so many times coaches will run stuff that, the guy, even at the NC2A Division One level, watching some of these uh, March Madness games, it's like, okay, you ran stuff, guy caught it, he held it, instead of, no, you got the closeout, now go, now go. Right. Now the guy's in neutral. You don't have an mm-hmm. advantage. Sorry, you're screwed. And then, okay, we're deep in the shot clock. What do they do? Let's go high ball screen, okay, and then create the advantage. Let's get a shot. They end up taking a step back, hop, hop back, three or a contested two and they wonder why they're losing San Diego state anyway. So that's my subliminal Diego, Love it. San Diego state's offense. Sorry. Sorry, coach. Uh. <laughs> no, so one specific question I have then kind of about the blender game um, sure. is, you know, player gets into the paint. They use the advantage help comes ball is kicked out. Oftentimes defenses start to rotate. So maybe they can cancel that first advantage a little bit, but if you keep it moving, things still go. How are you teaching that player that initially kicked the ball out to re-space? Does it depend where the ball is passed to? Are they just reading and feeling? What does that look like? You know, uh, I have to do better at that. I'm not, I'm not, we're not, we're not graded as a team. And if you have any suggestions, I'm ready. Um, But basically our principles, these are our player principles right here. Uh, And I'll, I'll send, send one to you just based on reading other Great minds work. Mark Cassio, uh, Noah LaRoche, uh, Driscoll, uh, the guy who coached in Guam. I can't remember his name. Brent Tipton. Tipton was great. There's another guy yeah. out there, too, that was great, too, um, where they, they had written down stuff. And during COVID, I would listen to their talks and go like, these guys are brilliant. They do what I do, but they say it so eloquently that's why sometimes i mean i'm hesitant to do podcasts because i don't want to feel like i'm a dumbass you know it's like you know it's like these guys are the brilliant guys that have figured it out so i decided to write things down and hand it to my team like defensive principles this is our model of how we play and the percentages off a drive and kick of you driving again you've already you're driving against a constricted defense now you need Mm -hmm. to expand them again so it should be drive, kick, kick. Um, and after, you know, a skip pass close out, then you can, you can drive against a skip, you can shoot it. And obviously you can move the ball again. Um, but there are certain rules and concepts and principles that we align ourselves to align ourselves with, with, and I made this talk to our AAU slash high school team the other day is that, um, Noah LaRoche's term, I don't want to copy him, but Shared cognition. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everybody has this, that synergistic understanding of how we play and making the right decision on that one more pass or whatever. Um, Every single time your feet should be attacking the rim that I want them to hop on every catch. I just don't want you catching and passing the ball. I want you to be a threat to shoot it or drive it, but you're making the decision like, Oh, I'm going to move the ball now. And, uh, so it just takes lots of reps, lots of disadvantage games too. Four on three, uh, um, coach passes the ball, closing out on that person. They drive and they're working on their active spacing that you did in terms of four and oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we are nowhere near now where we were 2019 because we had, I mean, my team in 2019, I'll send you a video and it. I mean, you might have seen it that Coach Z sent out about. Oh yeah, I've seen it years ago. I mean that that's magical possessions right mm-hmm. there. Every possession was something where the decision was great, the execution was great in terms of the pass, the feet were great, and the shot was great, even if it didn't go in. And the thing I want to talk about uh, as well, I don't know if you had any offensive rebound questions in there. I don't remember that exactly, but. Um, offensive rebounding, when you play this style, has you have to adjust your offensive rebounding to now this style as compared to old school, mm-hmm. you know, as far as getting in the post and so on and so forth. Because all these threes that are taken, 
the misses are long, not long off the back rim, but the ball's going to bounce and go farther. So we train our girls like a tennis player or a baseball player to react to the ball off the rim like a tennis player reacts to the ball off strings with a split step, I might add, a baseball player with their split step to the crack of the bat. Mm -hmm. we, we have a code or phrases that track, react, attack. So I'm tracking your shot, John, as it's in flight, and I'm taking a couple of steps forward because most of the time, you know, they're not denying me the ball on a, on a, on a, on a shot attempt on three, they're usually off me, but I'm taking a step to that 15 foot arc, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I'm reacting to that ball off the rim. So we track how many offensive rebounds we get. And I always use the, the uh, analytical term. Well, if we shoot nine out of 30 from three, that's 30%. That's not, that's okay. It'll win a lot of games, especially at our level and high school level, 30% is, you know, 45% from two, and it's like 0.9 in terms of points per mm -hmm. possession. But let's say we get 10 offensive rebounds on those 21 missed shots. Well, now we're nine out of 20 in terms of possession, and mm -hmm. our points per possession is 27 points in 20 possessions. So we train them to have four people drift in. Well, what you're going to get – this is my know-it-all voice. You're, you're going to – they're, they're gonna they're gonna cherry pick you're gonna get beat back well the shooter's drifting back on the shot what happens if it's a baseline shot and i'll just say dude that ball when it's rebounded off the rim i have two players 15 feet away and if they react to get it and they don't get it they should react to sprint back right mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and we rarely get beat on a cherry pick or somebody cheating deep, rarely, rarely. And I think there's a new, I don't know who did this. Help me with this. Tagging. Yep. Tagging up. up. Right? It's Aaron Fern brought that from, oh, he's, he's a uh, coach in Australia for a little bit. He's now at Charlotte on the men's side, but I think he kind of popularized it. What's his name? Aaron Fern. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, we don't do that, but we track, react, attack the ball. And Love if we it. don't get it, react, sprint, locate, communicate. So getting back to shooting in terms of teaching shooting, when you teach your players, you know, it's like react, sprint, boop, communicate, locate, track, react, <laughs> attack, get back. Uh, and if you get those – and, you know, it's so annoying when you watch an NBA game now because when somebody shoots the three – they're not in the picture anymore. They're already jogging back because they don't mm -hmm. want to get beat. Warriors have kind of figured it out because they'll send Looney and they'll send when DiVincenzo or Wiggins, when he starts playing again, they'll be their crash reactors for those long rebounds. And right. Steph and Clay and Draymond, they're all, they're all back. They don't, they don't attack that, but we attack with four. And that's a key yeah. component of our offense is, and some coaches around our area says, you know, you shoot the ball well, your defense is good, but your offensive rebounding is unbelievable. It's like you have to train them to do that. Absolutely. Uh, and and for, for people that haven't seen you play, you know, it's you have a very skilled team, but you guys aren't always the most physically imposing. And so you, you're, yeah. you're not grabbing offensive rebounds either with the world's best, best and biggest. And right. so I, that, that that's incredibly impressive for sure. Yeah. Well, I always um, like to say we're, we're small, but we make up for it by being really slow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but no, but this is the thing. When you have these types of players, people will say, I can't believe how fast your team is. And it's like, no, no. If you put my team in a hundred meter dash, they're not fast. They've got basketball speed. Well, what's mm -hmm. that? It's like, well, they get to sprint speed right away because we train their feet to be that way. Their cuts are sharp, precise. They are in a strength program. They're in an agility program where everything is being maximized for basketball as well. So um, those are the things that make us, oh, you guys are so fast. No, our pace is quick and fast. Our girls are quick. You know, they're not, you know, they're not Usain Bolt running straight right. in line. They're trained to be at basketball quick. No, I, I love it. Well, 
before we do wrap up, I guess I have one final question that, that I think will be helpful to coaches that are looking to play this way. Um, and that's just kind of what is either the biggest challenge that you found from year to year trying to install it, maybe some common habits you have to break or things you have to correct. Um, and then for, for those things, whenever you've identified them, what are good solutions to help? It's shooting, 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 shooting. It's the most important skill in basketball. It's become more prevalent common knowledge now that shooters are the most important people on the floor. You have to, I mean, look at LeBron. (laughs) He sucks when he doesn't have shooters around because Mm -hmm. they're going to look at, you know, Giannis as well. It's the same thing. If, if somebody can catch and shoot and play solid principle D they're going to play on a team. And that's what I tell players individually going back to their team. But as a coach that's trying to implement the system, there are coaches around here and coaches around the country that have implemented this and love it. It, It's like, it's not known out there in United States that you can win by developing shooters and developing Mm -hmm. these things and treating them like a golfer and making sure they master this and have a practice that develops those skills where they are fun to play with. And it's a fun style to play. And it shrinks the gap between the teams that are bigger, stronger, more athletic than you. It, it shrinks the gap between that. You can compete with them. Um, I always like to say, I'm not going to name the coach's name, but I had a player I was trying to sell upon this division two coach and she looked video at her and she said, Oh, she can shoot. Well, she looks like a great kid, but we're l- looking for somebody a little longer, more athletic that, uh, that can press a little bit that do does this. And I, I said to her, I said, well, you know what? I looked on your stats and it, you had one girl at 33%. Everybody else was like in the twenties. Maybe if you recruited shooters, like we develop at Pinewood, you might win a conference championship like we win league section NorCal and state championships. Mm-hmm. Funny story. And she didn't, she didn't end up going there, but two years later, their team lost their two post players and they played four guards. They won the national championship. No kidding. Yep. That school shall remain nameless Westmont. Anyway, <laughs> That's my uh, Kevin Nealon subliminal joke there. You know, it's like, really? No, they played modern basketball. And -hmm. and I love, I I sound cocky and arrogant. I'm not. But we have a t-shirt we wear that we don't play like the Warriors. The Warriors play like us. Because they adopted our style of play. Because they had the shooters. Mm -hmm. And Kerr is big pop guy, as well as you know, Phil Jackson stuff. And he's in the movement and all those things as well. And people will look at you guys play just like the Warriors. No, no, you got it wrong, dude. Have you watched this play for years? This is how we've played for a long time. Love it. And they've copied us. And interesting to note, Vince Scully, it's something to where Joe Lacob's sons who now work for the Warriors played for Menlo, which is in our area. And our girls team would play before our girls team would play Menlo girls their Menlo boys would play our guys. He watched our game and he looked at me and says, I love how you're uh, right when he bought the words. I love how your team plays. I love how your team plays. And one of my friends said, he told the coaches they have to play like the Pinewood girls play. When he I love it. it. And just saying, I don't know if the guy was lying to me about it, but we play like the warriors and uh, we don't run a lot of their actions uh, in terms of the split, but we do a lot of their stuff as well. So no, I, I love it. Well, I, I can certainly say someone who's, who's watched you guys from afar. I'm very thankful for YouTube, uh, the stuff you've put out on the NFA chess network. I'm right. so impressive and, and just have so much admiration for how you run things. And I've learned so much from you. So thank you well, again, I, coach. It's, for, it's for, mutual too, oh, John. Good. You put out some great stuff. People are lucky to have you, oh, thank uh, you. sharing all that stuff because you share a lot of great stuff. And uh, anytime you learn something from somebody else and you put it on your your uh, YouTube page. Believe me, I steal the crap out of it too. So that's uh, good. That's good. Well, the ball on the, the ball. I don't know who stole the ball on the back. You know, mm-hmm. it's like all our girls have great finishes, but now they need to add that defensive contest. And there's lots of different finish drills where you have that advantage, where you have to figure out 
which finish to do at the right time based on a stimulus of having a defensive player there. So certainly, thank certainly. You for being so great Good. for the game. Yeah, totally. Well, if, if anyone does watch this and they want to get in touch with you, they want to learn more about your program, uh, and, and if you're willing to share, what's maybe sure. the best way for, for them to reach out to you? Uh, D. Shepler. Yep, it's right there. Pinewood.edu. Perfect. And, uh, that's how they do it. Um, I, I don't want to get my cell number over here, but they can they can contact you to get my cell number if they want. And I, with the clinics I've done, I'm, you know, there's so many great people in basketball because they're all sharer of knowledge. I mean, uh, Kurt Gelsdorf and Coach Hart mm-hmm. with System Basketball, they do such a great job of sharing the game and making other coaches better that, you know, if every coach had that growth mindset of becoming better for their players, um, the game would be a lot better. And uh, that's, that's something that every day I'm, I'm looking to try and get better myself and I'm 69 years old. So um, coach for 47 years. And if I have that desire to get better, if somebody that's just starting out or somebody that's coached for 25 years, uh, why don't you want to get better? You know, that, that's the purpose. If we ask our players to get better, why can't we get better? So um, always looking for that. Absolutely. Well, Coach, thank you again. Uh, so grateful for your time. And we'll, we'll definitely continue to stay in touch here throughout the spring and summer. Terrific. Were, did you send me, I think years ago, you sent me shooting drills? Did you oh, have, probably. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an updated copy of that? I, I've, I've not yet. We really I'm haven't added shooting drills. Yeah, yeah. We, we've not I'm added too too many new drills. ones, so it's it's oh. much of the same for us. Yeah. Well, you know what drill I like. I don't mean to keep you long. No, you're good. I learned from uh, she coached at Minnesota this year. Lindsay Whalen, maybe her name was yep, that. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's nine spots. Mm-hmm. So base in between the wing and the base slot top, so on, and you can do it in a group. Or you can do it individually with one ball and one shooter. And you get four shots. If you make four out of four, you skip the next spot. You go from one to three. If you make three out of four, you go from one to two. If you make two out of four, you stay there. If you make one out of four, you go back. If you go zero out of four, not only are you going to hell, but you have to go back to the start. So you put time on the clock and you work and – based on where they get. And it's a great competitive drill oh, because yeah. get braggers rights. Have you ever, have you ever done that before? No, but I, I will definitely it's, use it. It's on, do it as a team in a group, put your yep. four best shooters. And I work it to show you how great my shooters are. I had a girl in three minutes go around and back. Now keep in mind, that's nine spots. Mm-hmm. She made like 16 in a row. So she Jeez. went from one to three to five to seven to nine and then three out of four. And she got back the other way. Some of them, I egotistically uh, based males at my house. When I work with them, I'll just say, well, Joe got, Joe got done in a minute and a half. What? You know, you, you got done in five and a half minutes. That's really good. Or you had to start at the beginning. So it's a great, great shooting drill um, that I love. It's, it's our, it's a drill that we use like one every th- three days. And it's, oh, I uh, love it. Yeah. We, we're always looking for new ones ourselves. And so I, I yeah. think like you guys, we, we try to shoot a ton in practice and um, that's one thing our teams have always done well. And it's just cause we do it a lot. So yeah, the more the yeah. merrier. And that's why you win. Yep. Concept, right? It's, well, what a concept, but do that drill. They'll love it. They love will it. love it. And then they'll get, you'll get to a point where your shooters will become so good that you have to say, okay, you're going to, one girl, you have to shoot it from college three between the college and the NBA, NBA three farther uh, on each spot. And it's like every four shots is different. Mm-hmm. And we'll see how good you are, you know, rather than the same spot every time. Just to challenge them neuromuscularly to come up with that when they get good at it, of course. Um, no, for sure. Anyway. That there's a great right. one. Great talking uh, to you. Yeah, we'll talk soon, coach. Thanks again. All right. I hope this is the most popular one you have. Hey, ab- absolutely. I, I certainly had a good guest for it. All right. All right. Take care. Yep. Thanks, John. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye.